grateful for you and for what you are doing and for all that you have planned for us. All that you have planned. Father, we delight in what you have done and we delight in this day. We delight in your Shabbat. <coughs>
Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with your commandments and has commanded us to be a light unto the nations and has given us Yeshua the Messiah, light of the world. Bless you, 
have plenty. Do you have that one in there? Passover is next fr next Saturday. It begins Friday night. We'll be having our um, community dinner second Saturday, second night, which is Sunday night, Saturday night. I mean, I'll get this correct. I promise. <laughs> Pesach, or Passover, is Friday. That would have been the day the lambs were sacrificed. Friday night is the first night of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So on that night is usually a Seder or the next night, which would be Saturday night. And that's what we're going to do. Saturday night we will have our Seder here. It's going to be interesting, but this is a song that we will be doing because it's traditional song, it's Eliyahu Hanabi. Let's see if I can remember it right. Eliyahu Hanabi, Eliyahu 
should we practice um, Dayenu? We do, I'm going to have to get the other book out. I don't have these books. Dayenu. Huh? Dayenu. Yes, we should. I'm going to go get my other my book that has Dayenu in it. This is on my desk. I have been practicing these um, all week, but we've also been moving <coughs> and lifting and stirring up dust. <coughs> and <coughs> and <coughs> all kinds of things, right? Okay. Dying is pretty simple once you get it. Do we have the English too? On the other side? Yes, we do. Huh? Yes, yes. All right. Next part doesn't come. Is that okay? She 
Huh? Uh, the first part that you mentioned that it's not appreciated. Right. Or appreciated. And you know, in reality, in modern Christianity, the whole concept of Egypt and coming out of Egypt is a correlation to our salvation. Yes. Our being brought out of the world of sin and death into the promised land. Had he brought us out of Egypt and just did that, it would have been enough, right? If he brought us out of sin and death, wouldn't that have been enough? And unfortunately, I believe that most of the church does stop there. And they park there, and they say that's enough. But it's not enough. God has more. God has much more. Um, we're going to go ahead and do the Torah reading. Because in the Torah reading, he talks about some of the steps it takes. to. Today's Torah reading is one of those that's not the most fun to read. Poor Craig. Last week, we read about childbirth, and we read about things that make us unclean, right? And today we're going to read about more of that uncleanness, except that today we're going to read about what it takes to go from unclean to clean. And then I'm going to talk about what causes unclean and what it's really about, because it's not about the obvious in some ways. Today's Torah, today's Torah reading begins in Leviticus chapter 14, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. Now he shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out to the outside of the camp. Thus the priest shall look, and if the infection of leprosy has been healed in the leper, then the priest shall give orders to take two live, clean birds and cedar wood and a scarlet string and hyssop for the one who is to be cleansed. The priest shall also give orders to slay the one bird in an earthenware vessel over running water. As for the live bird, he shall take it together with the cedar wood and the scarlet string and the hyssop and shall dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was slain over the running water. He shall then sprinkle seven times the one who is to be cleansed from the leprosy, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the live bird go free over the open field. The one to be cleansed shall then wash his clothes and shave off all his hair, and bathe in water and be clean. Now afterward he may enter the camp, but he shall stay outside his tent for seven days. And it will be on the seventh day that he shall shave off all his hair. He shall shave his head and his beard and his eyebrows, even all his hair. He shall then wash his clothes and bathe his body in water and be clean. Now on the eighth day he is to take two male lambs without defect, and a yearling ewe lamb without defect, and three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering and one log of oil. And the priest who pronounces him clean shall present the man to be cleansed and the aforesaid before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Then the priest shall take the one male lamb and bring it for a guilt offering with the log of oil and present them as a wave offering before the Lord. Next he shall slaughter the male lamb in the place where they slaughter the sin offering and the burnt offering at the place of the sanctuary, for the guilt offering, like the sin offering, belongs to the priest. It is most holy. The priest shall then take some of the blood of the guilt offering, and the priest shall put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, and on the right thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest shall also take some of the log of oil and pour it into his left palm. The priest shall then dip his right hand finger into the oil that, it is, that is in his left palm, and with his finger sprinkle some of the oil seven times before the Lord. And of the remaining oil which is in his palm, the priest shall put some on the right ear lobe of the one to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on the blood of the guilt offering, while the rest of the oil that is in the priest's palm 
he shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed. So the priest shall make atonement on his behalf before the Lord. The priest shall next offer a sin offering and make atonement for the one to be cleansed from his uncleanness. Then afterward he shall slaughter the burnt offering. And the priest shall offer up the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be clean. But if he is poor and his means are insufficient, then he is to take one male lamb for a guilt offering as a wave offering to make atonement for him and one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, and a log of oil, and two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, which are within his means. The one shall be a sin offering, and the other a burnt offering. Then the eighth day he shall bring them for his cleansing to the priest at the doorway of the tent of meeting before the Lord. And the priest shall take the lamb of the guilt offering, and the log of oil, and the priest shall offer them for a wave offering before the Lord. Next he shall slaughter the lamb of the guilt offering, and the priest is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering, and put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest shall also pour some of the oil onto his left palm, and with his right hand finger the priest shall sprinkle some of the oil that is in his left palm, seven times before the Lord. The priest shall then put some of the oil that is, in, that is in his palm on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on the place of the blood of the guilt offering. Moreover, the rest of the oil that is in the priest's palm he shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed, to make atonement on his behalf before the Lord. He shall then offer one of the turtle doves or young pigeons which are within his means. He shall offer what he can offer, what he can afford, the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering, together with the grain offering. So the priest shall make atonement before the Lord on behalf of the one to be cleansed. And this is the law for him in whom there is an infection of leprosy, whose means are limited for his cleansing. The Lord further spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, When you enter the land of Canaan, which I give you for a possession, and I put a mark of leprosy on a house in the land of your possession, then the one who owns the house shall come and tell the priest, saying, Something like a mark of leprosy has become visible to me in the house. The priest shall then order that they empty the house before the priest goes in to look at the mark, so that everything in the house need not become unclean. And afterward the priest shall go in to look at the house. So he shall look at the mark, and if the mark on the walls of the house has greenish or reddish depressions and appears deeper than the surface, then the priest shall come out of the house to the doorway and quarantine the house for seven days. And the priest shall return on the seventh day and make an inspection. If the mark has indeed spread in the walls of the house, then the priest shall order them to tear out the stones with the mark in them, and throw them away at an unclean place outside the city. And he shall have the house scraped all around inside, and they shall dump the plaster that they scrape off at an unclean place outside the city. Then they shall take other stones and replace those stones, and they shall take other plaster and replaster the house. If, however, the mark breaks out again in the house after he has torn it out, after he has torn out the stones and scraped the house, and after it has been replastered, then the priest shall come in and make an inspection. If he sees that the mark has indeed spread in the house, it is a malignant mark in the house. It is unclean. He shall therefore tear down the house, its stones and its timbers, and all the plaster of the house, and he shall take them outside the city to an unclean place. Moreover, whoever goes into the house during the time that he has quarantined it becomes unclean until evening. Likewise, whoever lies down in the house shall wash his clothes, and whoever eats in the house shall wash his clothes. If, on the other hand, the priest comes in and makes an inspection, and the mark has not indeed spread in the house after the house has been replastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean, because the mark has not reappeared. To cleanse the house, then, he shall take two birds and cedar wood and a scarlet string and hyssop, and he shall slaughter the one bird in an earthenware vessel over running water, 
And he shall take the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet string with the live bird, and dip them in the blood of the slain bird as well as in the running water, and sprinkle the house seven times. He shall thus cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and with the running water, along with the live bird and with the cedar wood and with the hyssop and with the scarlet string. However, he shall let the live bird go free outside the city into the open field. So he shall make atonement for the house, and it shall be clean. This is the law for any mark of leprosy, even for a scale, and for the leprous garment or house, and for a swelling, and for a scab, and for a bright spot, to teach when they are unclean and when they are clean. This is the law of leprosy. The Lord also spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When any man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. This, moreover, shall be his uncleanness in his discharge. It is his uncleanness whether his body allows its discharge to flow or whether his body obstructs its discharge. Every bed on which the person with the discharge lies becomes unclean, and everything on which he sits becomes unclean. Anyone, moreover, who touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And whoever sits on the thing on which the man with the discharge has been sitting shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and shall be unclean until evening. Also, whoever touches the person with the discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Or if the man with the discharge spits on one who is clean, he too shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And every saddle on which the person with the discharge rides becomes unclean. Whoever then touches any of the things which were under him shall be unclean until evening. And he who carries them shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Likewise, whomever the one with the discharge touches without having rinsed his hands in water shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. However, an earthenware vessel which the person with the discharge touches shall be broken, and every wooden vessel shall be rinsed in water. Now, when the man with the discharge becomes cleansed from his discharge, then he shall count off for himself seven days for his cleansing. He shall then wash his clothes and bathe his body in running water, and shall become clean. Then on the eighth day he shall take for himself two turtle doves or two young pigeons and come before the Lord to the doorway of the tent of meeting and give them to the priest. And the priest shall offer them, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. So the priest shall make atonement on his behalf before the Lord because of his discharge. Now if a man has a seminal emission, he shall bathe all his body in water and be unclean until evening. As for any garment or any leather on which there is a seminal emission, it shall be washed with water and be unclean until evening. If a man lies with a woman so that there is a seminal emission, they shall both bathe in water and be unclean until evening. When a woman has a discharge, if her discharge in her body is blood, she shall continue in her menstrual impurity for seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. Everything also on which she lies during her menstrual impurity shall be unclean, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean. And anyone who touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And whoever touches anything on which she shall sit shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Whether it be on the bed or on the thing on which she is sitting, when he touches it, he shall be unclean until evening. And if a man actually lies with her so that her menstrual impurity is on him, he shall be unclean seven days, and every bed on which he lies shall be unclean. Now if a woman has a discharge of her blood many days, not at the period of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond that period, all the days of her impure discharge she shall continue as though in her menstrual impurity she is unclean. Any bed on which she lies all the days of her discharge shall be to her like her bed at menstruation. And everything on which she sits shall be unclean like her uncleanness at that time. 
Likewise, whoever touches them shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes, and bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. When she becomes clean of her discharge, she shall count off her for herself seven days, and afterwards she shall be clean. Then on the eighth day she shall take for herself two turtle doves or two young pigeons, and bring them into the priest, to the doorway of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her on behalf, make atonement on her behalf before the Lord, because of her impure discharge. Thus you shall keep the sons of Israel separated from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by their defiling my tabernacle that is among them. This is the law for the one with a discharge, and for the man who has a seminal omission, so that he is unclean by it, and for the woman who is ill because of menstrual impurity, and for the one who has a discharge, whether a male or female, or a man who lies with an unclean woman.
Last week, I talked very, very briefly about the concept of unclean and clean that the word talks about. <laughs> the whole tuma and tahara, tuma being unclean, or being clean, and tahara being unclean. We hear about ritual purity and impurity and, and all of that, and we go, what is that about? Because we don't have a temple today. We don't go through this process in order to be in the temple. We don't even understand the fact that being clean and unclean is not about sin. It's not about our sin, anyway. It's nothing sinful or wrong for a woman to have a baby. In fact, it's a great joy and a great honor that God gives us. There's nothing sinful or wrong about a couple, a married couple having intimate relationships. Nothing sinful or wrong about that. There's nothing sinful or wrong about having a discharge that you don't have control over. It's a normal, natural process of life, right? So why is that unclean? Why does that... And what does unclean mean anyway? Unclean basically means you're not able to go into the tabernacle or the temple. And the reason behind that is kind of one of those strange little concepts that we don't always think about. But everything that we read about here that creates uncleanness is something that is related to life and death. Specifically, the concept of mortality. We are mortal. We will all die. There's only one way out of this life, and that's death unless and until the Lord comes and, and, and takes out those who are alive. But the only way out of this life that we know of at this point in time is death. We are mortal. Each of the things that it mentions here has to do with life and death issues. It has to do, you know, having a baby is about life and death. Any woman who's ever had a baby understands that process. Sometimes in the midst of it, you're going, God, could I just die? You know? There's, there's the shedding of blood. Blood, by the way, represents our life. Life is in the blood, right? The scripture says that. This is one of the reasons that um, in many, many groups don't allow or don't recommend or, or speak against the whole concept of having a blood transfusion. Because life is in the blood. And if I take your blood, then I'm taking your life into my body. Now, I don't, don't hold to, I Honestly, I've got to tell you, I think that's going a little too far. If you need a blood transfusion to stay alive, please use the blood transfusion. Don't misuse that concept. But yes, life is found in the blood. If we die, if we lose too much blood, we will die. It's as simple as that. If you don't have blood in you, you will not live. But there's another side of that blood also in that, in that we find that in the sacrificial system of the blood we are given a different life and we are given a new life. So that life is in the blood, not just our blood. All of these things remind us about mortality. Each of these things is a brush with it. We come in contact with a dead body, that makes us unclean. We have childbirth, that makes us unclean. Seminal initiation, unclean. Carnivorous animals, unclean. Loss of life itself, unclean. Those are normal, natural parts of life that we all deal with. There's another side of it, too, though, that is in regards to different immorality and different idolatry that is a different type of uncleanness, and yet it is still the same thing. Because you see, immorality makes us unclean too. If we worship a false idol, idolatry makes us unclean because we're not worshiping the true God. It's not just about sin. It's not just about those things. Different levels of uncleanness have different responses and different levels of cleansing that need to be taken place. Did you notice that? With some of these, there's a sacrificial thing that needs to take place. With some, you just need to take a bath. Only it wasn't a standard bath. It wasn't go take a bath and come home. It wasn't that. It was a, it's called a mikvah. And in order to go through a mikvah, by the way, you have to already be physically clean. 
You're already bathed. The mikveh isn't about being clean in a physical sense. And the whole concept of unclean and clean isn't about being unclean or clean in a physical sense. It's about the spiritual sense. If you are tame, you must refrain from interaction with other people, right? Did you notice that? If you are unclean, you are not to be around other people. And in fact, depending on the degree of uncleanness, you might have, you have to leave the camp. The concept of leprosy that it talks about is not the kind of leprosy that we're familiar with today. It's a whole different process, a whole different thing. It describes it differently. It's not the disease that we call leprosy. That was a mistake and a bad translation from generations back. But it has to do with sin, with, with that uncleanness that actually takes a physical sense. Why? Well, God has given us all these ways of recognizing our mortality and acknowledging our mortality. And in acknowledging our mortality, acknowledging who gives us life, and that would be God. When we slander or speak evil of another person, we, in a sense, are committing murder of their relation, of, of their, how do I explain it? When we slander another person, we are murdering their reputation. The reason I said that and bring that into this is because when we speak evil of someone, we're bringing death to something, both in ourselves and the other person. Why do we say the evil, speaking evil being a leprosy issue? Because when Miriam spoke evil of her brother Moses, God gave her this disease. That was the first record of the disease in Scripture. That's, by the way, the only time, other than Moses being given it, when he was telling God, I can't go to Pharaoh, Moses was given it too, right? Do you remember that? When he said, I can't do this, I'm not going, I can't talk. God, put your arm in the cloak, pull it out, and it was white. Don't tell me what you can't do. You've just spoken a lie. You have just spoken death to my vision and to what I'm calling you to do. When Miriam spoke evil of Moses, or she spoke ill of him, actually, and it really wasn't necessarily, it was criticism. She and Aaron were criticizing him because of his wife. They didn't like who he had married. You don't like who you preach married? Sorry, I love him. He's staying. <laughs> but they didn't like who the preacher married. They didn't like who Moses married. How dare he? And Miriam got leprosy because she was assassinating or destroying or speaking death to the call of God on Moses' life. When we speak evil of someone, we're speaking death to their reputation. We speak death. It's, again, a part of life and death. It's related to death. It's related to mortality. The different processes of cleanness all, all go differently depending on what has brought about the uncleanness. But if we look at it this way, there's different levels and it gets worse and worse and worse. It's designed to teach us that God is the, God is the source of life. Well, what, is all of these, what are all these rituals about? The sacrifice, of course, we understand. The blood covers sin. We understand some of these other things. Some of this there is no understanding of in, our, in, in ways we look at it. This whole process of the two birds, the cedar word, the scarlet, and the hyssop. And I have found teachers on that, and I have taught a little bit on the details. And Each one of those details represents a little bit different part of what Yeshua, what Jesus has done. The different aspects of the sacrifice for us, of the life he lived and all of that. But I want to focus today on the living water. Because it says we need to use living water. And you need to immerse yourself in living water. Why living water? Because living water is God. It represents God. See, death reminds us what's important in life. You've seen those memes, right? I saw one just this last week. Nobody ever said at someone's funeral service, Oh, she had such lovely furniture and wonderful shoes, great taste in clothes. People don't say that at a memorial service or funeral service, do they? We don't talk about what things we have. We talk about who a person was. Death is a reminder that who we are 
is important. It's not about things. And who we are are children of God. Death can be the greatest spiritual teacher we ever have, if we'll let it be. I have a collection of owls. For those of you who don't know, there's some owls in my study. There's owls in my house. There's, I, I have a collection of owls. It didn't start off intentionally to be a collection, but that's what it's become. And that's okay. And I had someone come in my house once and get very upset with me because owls are bad. Really? Why are owls bad? Because owls represent death. Don't you know that? And, and I even re remember reading a book called When the Owl Calls My Name, and it does have to do with that whole concept of hearing the owl, and the owl representing death in, in the Native American cultures, first people's cultures, and I understand that concept. But I always understood an owl being something that had to do with being wise and wisdom, right? That's the Greek side of it. But if you think about it this way, what is more wise than being aware of our mortality? If we are aware of our mortality, we're going to live different. Bucket lists are a big thing right now. What's your bucket list? Meaning, what do you want to get done before you die? What do you want to do before you die? Being aware of the fact that we're going to die. But the other part of it to me is what other kind of death is there? It's not just physical death, right? When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden... When they ate of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, God said, For on the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Did they die that day? Physically, no. But their connection and closeness to God died. Their relationship to God died the day they disobeyed him. God says, I am your source of life. I give you instructions as a part of life, as your source of life. Follow me, obey me, do what I say. Because it's for your good and it's for life. We have reminders all the time about death. And if we will recognize them and if we will bring that all to God, then we have a humility about us that is different. There's nothing more humble than realizing that I have a very temporary life. I'm not going to be here forever. Nothing more humble than that. And God wants humility in us. He wants us to be dependent upon Him. To immerse in a mikvah, a body of water, which symbolizes the living God, is a very Jewish ritual. He talks about immersing in the water several times. In, in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, it talks about you've abandoned me and I am your source of living water and is referring to that water, that he is the water of life. I know most Christians think that baptism is a Christian tradition. What we don't know is it wasn't a Christian tradition. When John the Baptist came baptizing people, it was nothing new to them. Immersing in a mikvah is a standard part of the process. Anytime there's an uncleanness, you immerse yourself. If you want to go into the temple, you're going to immerse yourself before you walk in. Just in case. Yeshua went to John and was baptized, immersed in the Jordan. Why the Jordan? Because it's running living water. Baptisms are to take place in living water. That's what a mikvah is, is a baptism. When there's uncleanness, we baptize. What did Paul say about it? In chapter 6 of Romans, Paul said this, do you, know not, do you not know that all of us who are immersed into Messiah Yeshua are immersed unto his death? Not unto his life, but unto his death. You see, his death took our place. His death took our place. Our uncleanness went, goes on to him. So what we do in the baptism is a picture of the same thing. Just like God is the source of life for us, Yeshua is our source of life too. Yeshua is immersed unto his death, therefore we are buried together with him through immersion, through baptism, unto death, in order that just as Messiah was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. When we are baptized, it is a picture of the whole process. 
It's to help us recognize our mortality, recognize our death. What caused our mortality? Sin caused our mortality. Disobedience caused our mortality. Mortality is, was a natural result of sin. And so our clean cleansing had to come in a different way. And every time we're in contact with death, we're reminded of the fact that sin caused death. We're reminded of the fact that we have all sinned. And for those who don't think we have, the wonderful, wonderful book of 1 John. You know, John is the, is the disciple of love, right? He's the one whom Jesus loved, and he's considered the disciple of love. And, and in our wonderful Christianity today, in, in some sources, some places, I've actually heard that, I, I, I've actually heard that um, if you are, a Christian, you're not going to sin. Really? Well, if we walk in this life, we're going to make mistakes. Now, mistakes are not sin. But we're going to come in contact with death. It's going to remind us that we have a sin nature. Gospel of John is, the, and the book of 1 John is a book written by the man who knew fully the love of God understood it, and yet he said in chapter 1, verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and purify us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The reason we can't go into the temple when we are unclean is because it will cost us our lives. If you go into the temple unclean, you will die. If you don't take the message that death is important, then he will make sure you get the message that death is important. We understand that one of the things that Yeshua did when he died on the cross was to take our place, to die for us. Are we still going to die physically in this life? Yes. Because you see, that has not been fully conquered yet, but there's the day coming. When Messiah, Yeshua, Messiah, will conquer even death. Even death will be conquered. We don't have a baptismal here. We don't have a way to do that. We have a basin in the front where we wash our hands to represent being clean before God. That's a part of it. And that's part of why we have it out there. But one of the things in this fellowship is we recognize that Yeshua is the one who died for us. It's his blood, his life. He was the sacrifice. But we have to partake of it. We have to be a part of it. If you take a sin offering and it's not partaken of, sin was not taken care of. There's a place of humility that says that we are beginning, just beginning to understand some of this. I'm just beginning to understand some of this. I've been studying it for 10 years, and I'm just beginning to understand some of this. But what I understand most, and what I can't lose, and what we won't lose here, is that Yeshua was our substitute. We are in a new building. God has given it to us. I mean, literally, he opened the doors and whoosh, we came through them, right? It happened fast. Why? Because it's time. It was time. It's time for the new. And I love how God combined that with the month of Nisan, which is the head of the month, the first month, and the time of the new, the time of the sacrifice of the Lamb, the time of where, the, where the festivals start over again with Passover, Pesach. I love that he's timed it that way. He had to. But if we come into this new place and we're not partaking of the new life that is ours, through Yeshua, or if we have forgotten it and we have not been, and we need to be refreshed of it, then we are not going to be okay. For us to really walk in new life, we have to partake, and that's part of why we brought here the communion today, the bread and the and the grape juice, because I want us all to remember and to recognize who it comes from, where it is, that it's Him. We may be clean or unclean. He makes us clean. If we have sin in our lives, we confess it to him. He 
accepts our confession, there's a time frame of uncleanness. Did you notice that? Some people it's like seven days. Some people it's as long as the spots are on your skin, you are separated. Why? To give us time to contemplate, to think about it, to recognize what effect does this have on my life. Sometimes as believers in Messiah, we forget to contemplate and think about what effect sin has on our lives. And not just necessarily on our life, but what effect does our sin have on our relation, in our relationship with God? And it doesn't have to be a sin of a grave sin. It can be something simple. It can be just literally neglect. Being neglectful of our relationship with Him. If we neglect our relationship with Him, then we're going to be in trouble. There's an effect. There's a cause and effect that it has. When we neglect our relationship, we get farther away from the source. And we need to be reminded. And we need to remember. And I know I need to remember. This has been one of those years where I've been all over the place in some things. Mentally, emotionally, it's been hard. Have I been as faithful in my relationship with God as I should be? No. I'll be honest, no. Have I been on my face pleading and crying out for this house and for, for you guys not like I should be? And so I confess that to you today, that there's a place where we have to pray for each other. And, and yes, as much as I've prayed a little bit for you and some here and some there, it hasn't been the call that I need to be. And so I come back to him and I stop and I think, okay, God, this has had a drastic effect. My neglect has cost us. It's cost me. It's cost you. But, and here's the joy, we have a remedy, right? No. I hope that doesn't get in the way. We have a remedy. We have a remedy. And so I'm going to play a couple songs, and I'm going to ask you to kind of take a piece of bread and break it off, and just take a piece of the bread and take a cup, and then take it back and sit down, and we'll partake together when we all have. Okay.
prayed, he took the cup and the bread, and he lifted it up and he said, This body is this bread is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Hmm. Bread, the symbol of life. And it says he took the cup after supper. Just a little chewy bread. (laughs) The matzah's not quite so chewy, you (laughs) know. And he took the cup after supper, and we'll talk about that Saturday night when we do our Passover, our Seder. We'll find out about that cup after supper. He took the cup after supper, and he said, This is the New Testament, the New Covenant. This is representative of my blood. Drink ye all of it in remembrance of me. It's called King of Kings. who came as Messiah and presented themselves as Messiah was the time he spent going out and healing. He 
when walking, the lepers would come to him. He didn't stop them at a distance and say, don't come and touch me. He didn't stop them. When the woman came through the crowd and she was unclean from emission of blood and she'd been bleeding for years, he didn't stop her. And when she reached out and touched the hem of his garment, the zitzit at the end, when she touched the wings and was healed, he did not rebuke her. He did not. For someone to become clean from their uncleanness, there was a, something that had to take place. The priest had to take and go outside the city and sacrifice a heifer, a pure red heifer and had to burn it and collect the ashes and put it in the water. The water that was used to sprinkle to make you clean came from the ashes of a red heifer. The person who did that became unclean. They had to be ritually clean to take that red heifer out there and sacrifice it outside the city limits. Outside. They couldn't do it inside. Yeshua our sacrifice has been sent outside the camp, per se. Not just in the fact that he sacrificed his life outside the city on the hill of Golgotha, but also the fact that his own people do not recognize him as Messiah and have basically kicked him. He is as a leper to his own people. And if you try to talk about Jesus to someone who's been raised in Judaism, they're going to go, oh, stay away from me, right? Jesus, he's the impure one. He's the unclean one. He's the one that taught us to disobey the law, right? No, Jesus never did that. Yeshua didn't do that. But the Jesus we show to the Jewish people is as a leper. He is unclean. His, by being refused by his own people, opened up a door and a way for Gentiles to come in in a different way than they had before. He, it says, because they refused him, it was opened up to us. What we know is this. Jesus healed lepers. He touched them. So he must have become unclean for them, just as he became unclean for us. He is the one driven out of the city and sacrificed. And he is the one that restores us. He is the one that restores us. And the day is coming when he will be restored to his own people. And I believe it's coming soon. And they will look on him whom they have pierced and they will recognize him. That's out of Isaiah. They will look on him who they have pierced. And at this time we look on him. Through his substitutionary sacrifice, the suffering servant Yeshua, we are forgiven and made free from the power of sin and the power of death. We may die physically, but we will not dead forever. We may die physically, but we will be raised to walk in newness of life. When someone we love dies, we mourn. Why? Because we're going to miss him for a while. We're going to miss him. But Paul says we don't have to mourn like the world does, like those who don't have faith, those who don't believe, because we know we will see them again. Why? Because of Yeshua. The first fruits, the resurrected one, the one who's coming again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I know this was a bit disjointed in the way I tried to explain some of this, but I feel a bit disjointed still as we've got boxes everywhere and we're unpacking and we're looking for things and we're trying to figure out what did we forget, what did we leave. But I know that the most important part got through. I can see it. Because the important part isn't whether or not I can explain this well. The important part is, what did he do for us? 
And have we received it? And are we walking in it every day? He is the bread of life. This week we are eating bread that has yeast in it, as we would do on a Saturday, on a Friday evening for Shabbat. The bread of life. Next week we will be eating bread with no yeast in it, representing that which does not have sin, does not have pride. This week we see the humanity in this way. Next week we'll see his humanity in a different way. Abba Father, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the work you're doing in me and in my heart. And I ask God that you would continue. I ask God that you will take our our humility before you, our recognition that, Lord, without you we are dead. We're dead in the water. But with you there is life and life everlasting. And with you there is joy. Thank you for that. Thank you for this place. Thank you for those that you are bringing into this house, that you are going to be bringing in and going to be bringing in more and more and more. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. And keep you. And keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. And keep you. And keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And be gracious unto you. And be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up. The Lord lift up. His countenance. His countenance on you. And give you peace. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom Aleichem. Walk in peace through the week. And we will see you next week. And then, and it will look different in here. Because we have to set up for Passover. (laughs) 